Hey, y'all. So I've spent the last five years of my career kind of unpacking the complexities of the enterprise. And I thought that was going to be about scale and data security and privacy. But what I found is it's really meeting people who have entrenched ideologies and kind of working through that. We've heard a ton about the transformative power of design, and we know that investment is at an all-time high. But as a practitioner, I would tell you that just doing design thinking is not going to move the needle for your team. Don't kill me, Phil. It does not mean that I don't agree with what he just said, right? I've had the pleasure of kind of living that cultural expansion of design thinking across our organization over the last handful of years. And honestly, if it weren't for that, I don't think I'd still be at Big Blue five years on. Um, that was not the company that I thought that I was going to be moving into. We are not a startup. 400,000 people around the world, 105 years old. We were punch cards and typewriters and moon landings and winning Jeopardy. Um, and if you've heard about us lately, it probably is about our Watson cognitive capabilities and technology. And that is cool shit, right? It is taking over different industries. It is actually helping make differences around the world. But just having cool technology does not make a user experience. So I'm part of a team that has put Watson into the hands of consumers for kind of the first time. We just opened a beta. You can learn about it more downstairs or later. But the actual story is the fact that our organization was working on business email. We basically invented it like 25 years ago. I'm sorry about that. Um, and it took a lot of non-trivial steps to move from being folks who were kind of in a decline to saying, what would we do right now if we were going to reinvent ourselves and do something different? And I think this is an experience that a lot of you all in this room are living right now or have lived in the past. We don't have a tidy, finished outcome if we're in services or software. We don't build buildings. I heard this great Microsoft story one time. They watched a skyscraper go from completion or beginning to completion while they were still arguing over their next pivot, right? And so dealing with that kind of uncertainty takes leadership that is not top down. It's from the bottom up. And we hear about entrepreneurs, and we hear about being disruptors, and that's heralded at the company level and then challenged at that pragmatic level. And it's all about the culture, right? Like, what are we going to have? our hat on. We've got this printed up all over our studio. I think Luke killed it, right? We know that number one is how we want to live our lives, but at scale and with hard problems and with smart people, we debate ourselves to death. One of the reasons I think that IBM Design Thinking has been so effective for our team is because it wasn't a corporate memo and it wasn't some mandatory PowerPoint that we all sat in a room and watched while we were Facebooking, but it was actually changing the way we were empowered to make product decisions and, and things across the scope. And for us, these, these three Ps couldn't be more important, right? How are our practice repeatable? What are the places that make us want to collaborate with each other? And most importantly, like my personal soapbox is, who are the people that we're working with that actually do this stuff and make it happen? So we had to deal with user outcomes, and our organization struggled because it wasn't sales and marketing outcomes. We got to look at restless reinvention, which is a loop that's really kind of dear to my heart. And then our collaborative, diverse, uh, multidisciplinary teams is really what pulls it together. So if we think about this restless reinvention, there are the basic acts. There's designing, um, sorry, researching users. There are making prototypes. There are thoughtfully refining and making the next version better. But the biggest step here was getting people to understand you don't have to get it right the first time. That is transformatively different in a large company culture. We've got nine um, locations around the world for our specific little team. We've got 16 squads. So in software, we're like continuous, continuous delivery. There's basically somebody hustling all the time to get this stuff done. And those people are really the ones that are you know, worth getting up and talking about. We've got PhDs and kids right out of college. We have a guy who wrote for The Onion, a woman who branded an NHL team before coming here. The CMO of the Weather Channel heard about what we were doing and joined our team because he wanted to be a part of it. And I think at a nameless faceless, which is what I used to call corporations before I joined one, it's easy to not think about the person on the other end of that email chain, because I'm not going to probably have lunch with our Beijing squad. But it's all the more reason to create real foundational relationships, because those people are going to do that one little tiny intentional thing over and over and over again. And that is what changes. Right? We hear a lot about yes, and we hear about the power of the pivot and always being flexible. But for our team to succeed, we had to learn how to say no. We were told, don't use open software, open source software. We said, no. Only deal with current customers, no. Only deal with sales channels, no. And having the courage and passion to get up and say no to the wrong things every time with pressure is what helped us find our success. Um, Actually changing culture is super exciting, and it is addictive. It's the thing that keeps me going back to work, and it's the people that help make that happen. Thank you.